Thanks for joining us, everyone, for this uh, International Future of Law Association workshop. Uh, we're just going to really keep the introductions brief so we can jump into the content. But April, would you like to kick things off? Absolutely. Yes. Welcome, everyone. My name is April Dawson. I'm the Associate Dean of Technology and Innovation at the North Carolina Central University School of Law. Yeah. And I'm Kat Moon. I am Director of Legal Innovation or Director, I'm sorry, Director of Innovation Design at Vanderbilt Law School. And um, I also teach a whole bunch of things in design curriculum for our program on law and innovation. And it's good to be here today with you guys. And I'm Dan Lina. I'm the Director of Law and Technology Initiatives at Northwestern University. And I'm also a senior lecturer with a joint appointment in the law school and the engineering school. Uh, so Kat, you have a survey for us that you're going to kick things off with. Yes. Yeah. We wanted just to get a sense of um, where guys are, where y'all are coming from, what you've done, what you're interested in. And so this is a very, very brief survey. We would love just to take like the next 60 seconds really quickly for you all to um, complete the survey. And this will help us kind of target what we share and also shape our conversation as the um, discussion and workshop progresses. Um, you can answer anonymously or share your name if you wish. And then um, just give us a sense of if you've been using these tools, if you have what you would describe as your, your level of use. And then we've given you some kind of big buckets to choose from. What are you interested in most? And then um, there's a brief short answer. If there's something you really want to know about that we haven't listed, that's just a burning question for you. We would love to know. And I guess we need a little of that um, kind of game show music right now to be playing in the background while you guys are, are filling out. Um, and I'm sharing the link again. For folks who have just joined, I'll just kind of keep sharing it um, as people trickle in. Just a short Google form. And <clears throat> we see the response number growing. Ooh, beautiful pie charts being created. It's one of my favorite things about Google Forms, how satisfying it is to see that pie chart take shape as folks respond. And I'm going to keep talking because we don't have that um, game show music to play in the background. Let's see, one more person has joined, so I'm just going to pop it into the links again. Yeah, Scott, that's a great point. Some AI generated rights free music. Yes. I need to get on that. We need to be more organized next time. And we will credit you, Scott, for the idea. All right. We will take like literally about 30 more seconds. We've got 24 responses so far. All right, we've got 26 responses. I would say folks can keep filling that out, I think, to keep us on time and moving forward. Um, <clears throat> Dan, do you want to kick off? Sure. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so one of the challenges with doing a workshop like this is everyone is at kind of different spots. Some people have used this a lot. Maybe some people haven't uh, even experimented with, with it yet, but we hope you've signed up for an account and we're gonna do some hands-on exercises in ChatGPT. We have a document with some uh, prompts in it and just an outline and a couple of other links, but we're gonna walk through them in just a second. I'm gonna first just take about three minutes to really briefly talk about, well, what is ChatGPT? Uh, so it's a large language model 
optimized for dialogue. And these LLMs are trained on massive sets of text. And the whole idea is to create a probability distribution for sequences of words. Uh, so you can think about autocomplete on our iPhones and email apps and things like that, right? You can think about a sentence like Hannah is a, and even without any other context, we could predict the likelihood of certain words showing up there. The more context we have, um, even better if we've been training the model based on past text messages or emails or other documents, the better predictions we can make about what words ought to appear there. Uh, and so that's really how these, these systems work. But there are also some, uh, some important additions to this. So the original chat GPT was based on a GPT 3.5 series language model, but they're also using OpenAI as reinforcement learning from human feedback. So it's not just a large language model. There's a lot of uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback that's being used to steer these systems and, and other systems that are really a part of this chat GPT application. Uh, and now, of course, there's also a GPT-4 model that's available. So these systems can generate text in response to a prompt, revise writing, summarize text, generate ideas, answer questions in convincing language, might not always be right, uh, maintain a conversation, and then write and debug code. And just a really quick example of something that these systems do really well, like I, here's a chat that I gave uh, a system to write a law firm press release. No surprise, it does great at this because it's seen millions of press releases. So this is an example of a task it can do really well. And in fact, there's some areas of law where there's a lot of legal content on the internet and ChatGPT in its raw form can do pretty well, uh, providing legal analysis, answers to legal questions, and so on. Uh, but we know about this hallucinations problem that it'll sometimes write plausible sounding but incorrect or nonsensical answers. And a lot of us in the legal space have seen where it's just made up case names uh, and things like that. And so that causes a lot of concern. Uh, but the solution is that we need to give the facts to chat GPT uh, in these large language models. So if we have an existing contract, a court opinion, a deposition transcript, a collection of documents, and then we ask the, the tool to do something with that information for us, we're going to get a lot better results. Uh, so there's a variety of use cases thinking about that, summarizing different text, laws, court opinions, contracts, other documents, analyzing and revising contracts, drafting things like contracts, complaints, answers, briefs, analyzing those documents, improving the writing in those documents, uh, generating deposition questions, creating press releases and other communications, doing legal research. Uh, and then one of the things I'm really excited about is if we know the rules structure for something, the legal rules that need to be provided to someone, how could we use these tools to wrap around a really useful dialogue uh, for, for these chatbots? Another thing I'm gonna mention is the prompt engineering that's required to get good answers from these systems. And, uh, and I think a lot of people don't realize that if you put in the same question twice, you're almost certainly not gonna get the same answer, particularly if there's any complexity to it. So the way you ask the question, the information you provide makes a big difference on what you receive from the system. All right, so I, I dropped a link to this document right here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a prompt here. So I've been doing some work with the chatbot here in Chicago called Rentervention. One of the things we've been looking into in our innovation lab at Northwestern is how could we create tools that can help individuals solve specific legal problems, but also how can we create tools that can help upskill uh, and make more efficient and effective the attorneys and, uh, and, and paralegals and others who work for Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. So I have a prompt here that I'm gonna to give to ChatGPT and I'm gonna get it to the GPT-4 version. Now this is very detailed and I've used some legal knowledge here. I know what inputs I really need to be able to get a good answer. Uh, you know, what, what inputs, what answer, what information I'd need to really analyze a fact pattern. But I'm asking the system here to draft a legal memo in IRAC format. And I've also told it to include citations to a relevant ordinance, Illinois statutes and Illinois case law. So I'd welcome you to do the same, open a browser window with a uh, chat GPT in it. Now I've got ChatGPT Plus, so I'm gonna use the version four version of this. It's a little bit slower actually than some of the prior versions, uh, but usually you'll get a little bit better answer by doing that. So I just pasted that whole prompt in and let's see how it does drafting a, a legal memo. So it's seen legal memos before. It's not confused about this idea to draft it in IRAC format. It's able to, 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 to do that. Then it starts citing 
some of the relevant law, including specific titles and chapters. And when I checked this earlier, it was getting it right. It was picking the right Chicago, um, you know, Chicago residential uh, landlord and tenant ordinance sections, and also the right sections under right statutes under Illinois law. Okay, now this is a case that I haven't seen at site before. I've seen a couple of different cases that it cited before, and both times they were cases that you might cite in a, in a memo like this. And so it, it's going through the analysis. It's saying the landlord claimed it was beyond wear, wear and pair. Tenant disagrees. Citing the sections of the RLTO. Okay, and it makes a conclusion. This failure entitles the tenant to the full return of the security deposit. And it's because it didn't provide an itemized statement of damages and supporting evidence within 30 days. Okay, so we got it right. I didn't tell it what the law was. It figured out, it, it found the, the right law, right? It determined what the right law is and went through the correct analysis. Um, okay, well, what if I say, all right, draft me a demand letter based on this. Let's see what we get for a demand letter. And sometimes it's pasted in actually the, the, the Terry tenant information at the top as well, but at least the name part. Okay, so that's interesting. I think it's a pretty darn good uh, demand letter here. One of the things that's interesting is, is a couple of times when I've run this example through, it's uh, made the point that the tenant is entitled to double its security deposit because of the failure to comply with the act. Um, and so let's say you have to now file a complaint and let's see, maybe it'll make the request here. But once it gets going down this pathway, it's probably unlikely it's gonna pick up on that. Um, but again, that's an example of having to play around with this a little bit and figure out what kind of prompts result in you getting what you're looking for. But because of this, the statistical nature of these tools, I mean, that's one of the things to grapple with is, is concerns about, uh, you know, what kind of imp output you're going to get for any particular prompt. And like I mentioned before, the version four, GPT-4, is a little bit slower if you're using, doing it in your screen and you're using 3.5 version, which is the free version, it definitely is a little bit faster. But I mean, to, to me, this looks like pretty good work product and it's hitting on the, on the right points. Um, and of course, some of this is, a lot of this is information that I provided, but then it's also like in the, in the IRAC analysis, the legal memo, it did some of the analysis. It figured out the 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 days, um, you know, the notice period, and that the the uh, estimate hadn't been provided within the notice period. Okay, so it didn't make a demand um, for double the amount of the security deposit this time, right? So just an example. And then the last thing I'm going to show is, you know, can it actually draft a an opinion in order? Uh, be, could it be a tool for the judge to help a, create a first draft of the opinion and judgment? And I've got differing results each time when I've, what types of cases it cites, for example, um, in each, at each step of this. So hopefully you're trying this as well in your own browser window window in ChatGPT. Uh, and the fact, right, that it can keep track of these facts as you walk through it, 
is another really useful way to start giving the system some information, right? And, and what some people have found is even breaking it down even further, like giving it a, a pattern of facts and saying, what are the legal issues here, right? And then you get a result. And then you say like, okay, legal issue one, what's the legal analysis on legal issue one? The more that you can kind of break it down and get the system, steer the system going down a particular path that you want it to, to go down, the better results that you're going to get. Okay, and again, I haven't seen this particular case cited before, but the, every case, it cited a couple of other cases before, and they were on point cases. Probably not surprising because there are lots of websites here from Illinois Legal Aid Online, Lawyers Committee and Better Housing, uh, court websites, legal aid websites, where they have information, this sort of information. And given the way OpenAI developed this tool, you'd think it would have picked up on some of that information and be able to cite it uh, in a memo like this, in an opinion and judgment like this. So that's an example that I wanted to show. And uh, you know, I think it's pretty interesting. It has pretty interesting implications for what we're doing in law school, uh, what we're asking students to do in terms of, of drafting, legal memos, complaints, um, but also very practical applications for individuals to improve access to justice, but also thinking from on the court side, right? And I've been talking to more and more judges about how they're going to use tools like this in, in the cases that they hear. Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to April. Great. Thank you, Dan. All right. So I'm going to talk about how I am planning on using ChatGPT in my legal writing class, one of my um, upper level legal writing classes. Um, and I'm going to share my screen in just a minute. Um, but first, I was looking at the poll that Kat um, created and she put in the chat, the results. And at least more than a quarter of the folks here, not surprisingly, are interested in how ChatGPT is going to impact law school curriculum, how it's going to impact our pedagogy. Um, our students will be using it, whether we like it or not. Um, as Dan has uh, illustrated, lawyers and judges will be using it. So we have to make sure that we introduce it in some way, shape, or form uh, for our students within the legal education space. So let's see, I'm going to show you an assignment. I'm going to share my screen. This is a Word document that shows an assignment that is very similar to an assignment that I have used in my legal letters class. So this is a class that um, primarily two L's will take. Um, so it's not like first year legal writing. It's not a class that focuses on, um, it's not like a seminar class. It is a class designed to help students understand how to communicate these complex issues to clients or potential clients. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but I just want to give you a sense of what this question speaks to. So this is a class where we focus on representing tech startups. Um, and so the client, Jane Doe, um, they're starting a tech startup. They're concerned about their employees um, and how they can make sure that they protect themselves when it comes to employment restrictive covenants. So I've provided my students with you know, some facts about this particular client, um, what she's concerned about. And this is the assignment that I would give my students. Um, the assignment that I gave my students last semester did not have these additional instructions. And so this is what I am adding to the instructions for my students. So the first thing is I want them to use ChatGPT to generate that first draft. I think that's what lawyers are going to do, how lawyers are going to utilize ChatGPT. Our students may very well utilize ChatGPT in this way um, during their summer jobs. Uh, so I want them to become familiar with the application so they understand the limitations and how they can use it ethically. The other thing is, the other instruction is, like actual lawyers, my students still have to apply their own legal research and analysis to any draft that's created by ChatGPT, that that's just, you know, a draft document. It is not the lawyer's work product. And, and you can't take something that you create using ChatGPT and just let it go. There's still a lot that lawyers uh, and law students have to do. 
Um, I note here the final work product must include proper legal analysis and be well written and properly cited. And I'm really underscoring the proper citation. Even though this is a letter that you know, will go to a client, I have always required my students to include the citations. Their citations have to be included in EndNotes because I don't necessarily want to see it in the body of the letter or in a footnote form, but I want to make sure that anything that they include in the letter, they've got a source for it so I can go back and make sure that they have properly um, identified the source and that they are citing it. I require pinpoint citations. Uh, this last additional instruction is um, additionally students must pay attention to tone language and format to ensure that the letter effectively conveys their legal analysis and research. All right, so I'm going to do what Dan did and I'm going to highlight some language and then run it through chat GPT and I will share my screen. All right, so this is what I'm expecting my students to do. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to switch over and do a new share. I am going to use ChatGPT 3.5. I have four, but it is slower, as Dan mentioned. And so I'm going to go ahead and let you all see what it looks like in ChatGPT 3.5. All right, so this is the information that I just cut and pasted from the, um, from the assignment. And I'm gonna change one thing here. Well, actually, no, I'm gonna just keep it exactly as it is here. Um, I could change this. So instead of it saying, you have been assigned, I could just say, write a client letter, uh, but ChatGPT should be able to recognize that this is what I'm asking it to do. I'm also gonna go ahead and include here, um, uh, so request for sources. All right, so let's, and you can already see how um, this is quicker than ChatGPT4, but what you're getting with the speed may not be the same degree of accuracy, but it's amazingly fast. Um, again, this was a question that focused on restrictive covenants, what you might include in the restrictive covenants. You see here that we've got some North Carolina statutes. Um, there's also this website. So let me just kind of go back up here. Uh, we have, you know, Dear Jane, they were, you know, ChatGPT was able to recognize in the letter who the client was. Um, congratulations on the success of your business, right? Uh, let's see. And it's, and it's fairly well written. It's not as robust as what we need, particularly if we're talking about legal analysis and legal research. But we see here we've got non-compete agreement. We've got a non-solicitation agreement. We've got a confidentiality agreement, right? And this is hitting upon a lot of the areas that I would expect my students to include in the letter. Um, one thing that I'll also say is this written assignment comes after we have already gone over the law um, and policies as it relates to covenants not to compete and as it relates to employment agreements. And so my students don't begin with this assignment. We actually begin with studying the law. And then this is one of several assignments that they have, you know, after we've kind of gone over what it looks like when you're representing tech startups. But one thing we can see very clearly is we've got this language here, but there are no citations. And my students will have to do citations. Um, the citations, the sources that we have here, okay, there are some sources that are provided. Um, again, not as detailed as what we need. My, I would want my students to include some case law. And so even though ChatGPT provides them with a, a framework and provides them with, you know, some, you know, help, very helpful information and a, and a relatively good organized letter, it doesn't go far enough, of course. And so when, as I was thinking about the type of assignment that I wanted to um, assign my students to allow them to be able to better understand how they will utilize ChatGPT as practitioners, how practitioners are, are actually using it, and how they need to think about using it as students. The focus on 
being able to clearly identify where the information comes from, right, is where the lawyers and our students will have to do the heavy lifting. So my rubric has changed quite a bit, right? My rubric focused a lot on, not surprisingly, um, the sources, of course, but the writing, the organization, the transitions, um, just really good solid writing, being able to communicate effectively. That's still, of course, important with the finish, the, you know, the final product that my students turn in. But what I'm placing more emphasis on in the rubric and in their grade is how they take this document and go back through and figure out, okay, we've got this general information here. What more does it need? What are my citations? Have I really tied in the facts that I've been provided? And I've, have I elevated this from just a simple chat GPT uh, document to something that a lawyer would actually give to a client? Um, as chat GPT becomes more sophisticated, um, and ChatGPT4, I've run this through ChatGPT4 and the response from that iteration is more sophisticated than this. It still doesn't get you exactly where you need to go. But as you know, the technology becomes more and more sophisticated, we're gonna have to continue to evolve the assignments that we give to our students. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing now and just um, say a couple of other things that I've been thinking about. Um, these discussions that we're having in law schools, they're having at the elementary school level, high school level, college level, of course, and our students are coming in, um, will be coming in with a level of understanding of how to use these tools, which means one, that we as law professors and educators, legal educators and administrators, we have to make sure that we have a good understanding as well. And as we're thinking about assignments, we've got to think about what is it that lawyers are actually doing in you know, the, the actual practice of law and infusing that type of work in legal education much more. I do think that that pairs um, very well with the next gen bar. We know that this is something that we're gonna have to think about as we kind of restructure in some ways our um, the way in which we instruct our students so that they have more skills components within their classrooms. Um, and this is something that, you know, we just have to tack on top of that as well. And so I'm gonna go ahead and end it there, turn it over to Kat. And I'm um, looking forward to hearing what other folks have to say. Thank you, April, and thank you, Dan. And um, I want to get to kind of discussion and Q&A and interactivity as soon as possible. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> make a few points, but I want to keep it brief and really just build on what Dan and April both just shared. So they both <clears throat> use ChatGPT um, essentially how we think lawyers are starting to, if not are already using it to um, <clears throat> create first drafts, gather information, get started, um, provide something that you then can tweak and improve and perfect. Obviously the efficiency gains are clear um, and we certainly can jump into a conversation about accuracy and and issues that we need to be aware of as attorneys. But the bottom line is using this tool is no different than using any other tool. We still have a professional obligation to check our work, right? And so the question is, how do we design use cases that do help us become more efficient? I want to emphasize something that April just said, re-emphasize, hammer home, that this is truly an opportunity for us to train our students on these tools in ways that are gonna serve them well immediately upon entering the profession. And I think it's incumbent upon us as legal educators now more so than ever to understand how the profession is using these tools, what they're doing with them, what tools exist. And so I offered just to share a few thoughts about um, a recent experience I've had jumping into Case Tech's new tool, CoCounsel. And as I'm sharing my screen, I'm going to offer some context for this. Um, my goal with this is not to give you um, a deep dive into CoCounsel. 
um, I cannot, and I think everyone should be seeing um, my screen now. Um, it is, you You have to request a one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, tour of the tool. Um, you can't record it while you're in the Zoom looking at it. Um, they're still keeping a lot of things under wraps, but I wanted to point out a, a couple of things just so we understand that we are preparing students. I'm going to scroll up. We're preparing students. This is just the, the co-counsel page on the Case Text website. Um, this product, this platform is built using GPT-4 and it combines the data that Case Text already has, the legal data. So it's a really interesting combination of data that GPT-4 on its own does not have. I also wanna make the point because this was mentioned in the chat that there are privacy issues, right? Um, we're getting ready to do a boot camp for our students at Vanderbilt on using these tools as summer associates. And the first point we want to make is you cannot put confidential client data <laughs> into these tools, right? Um, because they are open, they're public. And um, interestingly about co-counsel, it operates primarily in safe mode. You have to make an effort actually to use it in a way that would share any information you put into it back out with the GP24 platform. Um, so it is not connected in a public way. It is designed to keep, for instance, um, a user's data siloed within the larger databases that you have access to through the tool. So I'm just going to scroll through the current skills that this product has, and I will tell you that I test drove it primarily as um, a, a practicing attorney. So I spent almost 20 years practicing before I started teaching. And as they are going through these skills, I saw an immediate and incredible use to gain um, a, a lot of efficiency in the work I used to do as a transactional attorney. It was incredibly clear to me. I also don't um, spend a lot of time doing practice oriented things. And so um, there may already be other tools that do some of these, these things quite well. So I'm not here to champion that co-counsel is um, truly breaking the mold, but I was genuinely floored by some of the things it does. Obviously, reviewing documents, um, it had an incredible ability to um, go right to and answer questions and do so in a way that took you right to the document, gave you an explanation, then let you look at the document exactly where the issue that you had a question about arose. Um, preparing for a deposition, you could feed in all the documents in a case and any other material that you were interested in the uh, platform consuming and then it could um, completely prepare you for that de deposition. Searching a database, um, that maybe is one of actually the least interesting but still a very powerful point. Writing a legal research memo, they are careful to say that um, it will not write your appellate brief for you, but it definitely, as we've been talking about, will give you a fantastic starting point to get going by um, identifying source material, identifying issues, and just um, giving you a place to start that is not the blank page. Summarizing, this was pretty incredible. I can't remember the exact ratio, but I think somewhere for every five pages of content, it would give you a three paragraph summary and you could ask for more or less detail in the summary. Um, that was pretty amazing. Extracting contract data and then con and then contract policy compliance. I did a lot of contract work as a practicing attorney and I saw instantly how this would have saved me an incredible amount of time. The contract policy compliance example for for um, specifically, you could search for compliance with a specific policy. It would give you a yes or no answer, and then you could click in to get an explanation of the yes or no answer, and then go directly to the contract that um, that was relevant to the compliance and whether it was yes or no. So it gave you it instantly enabled you to check the platform's work. So um, again, I point this out not to um, say that this is this is the holy grail as, as this partner from this law firm <laughs> um, is saying one of the skills is, but just to give you an idea, these are tools that are immediately available to our students when they enter the practice. And um, I think this is 
is just, you know, the, the tip of the proverbial iceberg. And so I'm going to shift now um, to a couple of other points I want to make. And then I want to jump right into the questions because you guys have responded pretty strongly to the choices we gave you. And you've also asked some great questions in the free answer. So um, I'm going to introduce you actually to another tool. So I want you to understand, for instance, that our students are not just using ChatGPT. Here is a handy tool called GPT Go. You do not have to sign up for it. According to um, this platform, they are giving you instant access to GPT Plus. So um, GPT-4, you can type a query in the chat box. And this is where it gets really interesting. So you will get a response from GPT on the right hand side of the screen, and then you will um, see in real time internet search results. Now the search results are not embedded in the response from chat GPT, but it gives you those side by side. So it's similar to doing a Bing search, but you're not having to log in. Um, so I point out that there really is no breadcrumb trail if you're wanting to track whether somebody has used ChatGPT if they have a plus account. Um, it's easy to um, see from looking at their account what they've done, not so with this particular tool. So um, I personally am working on a project with my school that is tasked with, we are tasked with helping our school develop a policy with respect to generative AI tools. And the response is, not that many of you are really interested in exploring that issue today. So I don't know that we're going to spend a lot of time with it later. Um, but I am going to type a couple, I'm going to type a, a preliminary query just into this, into the chat bot, in the chat box here to see um, what chat GPT, um, we think this is GPT-4, would say in response to the query. And the query is, as a legal education expert, write a policy for a law school that addresses the appropriate and ethical use of generative AI tools. The policy should apply across the law school curriculum and to all work produced by students. Um, so I've popped that in. Um, I, no, 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 no. Sorry. Here we go. I don't know why that popped up. So it is generating here. It's going a little bit more slowly. So that leads me to believe that it is um, GPT-4. Um, so it's giving you a policy, purpose, scope, definitions. Ah, so, so lawyerly here. Um, prohibited conduct, plagiarism, misrepresentation, permissible conduct, consequences of non-compliance, conclusion. So this gives you a framework to start with. Um, what I've done in chat GPT-4 is I've actually pasted in Vanderbilt's um, honor policy and asked it to customize a policy based on what we already have on the books. Um, you can also pop into GPT-4 your school's honor code policy and ask it um, what changes it would make or additions it would make to cover these tools based on the policy your, your school already has in place. Um, and you will see here that um, on the left-hand side, we also have some search results that are relevant to the query that was popped into um, the, ch the chat GPT box. So um, my primary goal was to share this just as an example of other tools that are out there that your students are probably using, and then it might also be useful to you. And finally, um, I want to jump to some of the questions that you all have popped in here, um, because if we look at the survey results, um, the biggest response, 31.3% of folks um, are interested in the impact of generative AI tools on the law school curriculum kind of generally, like what should we be doing? I think this goes to um, what obligation law schools have um, to be introducing these tools and how we should be using them in the curriculum. Um, a specific question, which I think is an excellent question that was asked um, by one of you 
um, relates to how can we use these tools to improve the way we teach, what we're teaching, course development. And so I wanted to um, refer everyone to a fantastic Substack blog on this very topic. It's called One Useful Thing by Ethan Mollick. I will put the, the links to both of these platforms in the chat box in just a second. Um, but I'm referring you specifically to his post on using AI to make teaching easier and more impactful. And he does something really helpful here. He lays out five strategies, every single one of which I think could apply specifically in a doctrinal law class. What he also does is explains um, using what we know about learning science, not something we talk enough about in legal education, by the way, but using learning science, talking about why you might want to use this method in your class classroom, how you set it up. And then he actually gives you prompts to use directly in chat GPT to um, play around with these things. So um, if you are interested in using these tools to um, design courses to improve your teaching um, and to use them interactively in the classroom. So you're also teaching your students how to use them. Um, this is a fantastic kind of one-stop shop resource that I would refer you to. He's also written an academic paper. He's got a draft paper that goes into a lot more detail. I'll, I'll share the link directly to that as well. Um, 